Chapter 1, October 1st, 1995, Fate of a Kinslayer. It's a rainy night in Camarocho. It's currently 5.47pm on the 1st of October 1995. You could not have guessed that from the chapter title. We need to know we weren't born yet. I remember where I was on, in on 1995. We see a man in a grey suit standing over the corpse of another man with a gun in one hand. He grabs a ring with the name Yumi engraved in it off of the floor as two police officers burst in to arrest him with him slowly turning to face the officers. It's so dramatic. Well, yeah, it's a crime story, isn't it? I, I, I really hope that in the actual game they're like, yep, that's me. You're wondering how <laughs> Sorry, I got into this got it. <laughs> We flash back to the previous night and see the man in the grey suit in a car alongside a man in a purple shirt. The man in the grey suit is named Kazuma Kiryu, the lieutenant advisor of the Dojima family, which is a subsidiary of the Tojo clan. That's my boy. <laughs> who's come along with Shinji Tanaka, another member of the Dojima family, to help him out with a collections run. Namely, they're here to collect money from a group of loan sharks working under the name Peace Finance. Peace Finance. Financing the peace. <laughs> you can just tell they sit around a campfire saying Kumbaya. I'll be, I'll be honest, when I think of Peace Finance, the only thing that comes into our brain is that image of uh, like <laughs> a clickbait <laughs> ad that's just accept Christ to get a free PlayStation oh 2. Oh god, I forgot Except about Christ this. to get a free PlayStation <laughs> 2 so you can play Yakuza 1. <laughs> so yeah, they're off to get money for Peace Finance, who are 200 million yen in debt with the Dojima family being paid with half of the money collected. Democracy. Communism. The opposite yeah, of I democracy. Think communism's just democracy with quotation marks. Can't stop. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> when they arrive, the man running the company begs to pay off the debt tomorrow. Kiryu and Shinji show no sympathy, due to it being blatantly obvious that they're trying to skip town, with the owner then grabbing a golf club and getting his employees to attack Kiryu due to rumours that the Dojima family kill and make examples of anyone who doesn't pay off their debt. To be fair, how are they going to get like 20 million yen in a day? 200 million. <laughs> oh, 200 million, Jesus Christ. How are they going to get that much in a day? I don't know, they're literally a loan company. But in this economy? I just naturally assume the economy everywhere is usually bad. <laughs> Kiryu manages to fight them off, while Shinji gathers the money they owe. Kiryu stating it's not the family's fault that Peace Finance owed money. Wow, the irony of Peace Finance. Can you believe it? Peace Finance acting violently? Oh my god, the prophecy is true. What prophecy? The prophecy we just made up. Shinji thanks Kiryu for the help, with him mentioning how Kiryu is currently set up to start his own Yakuza family. I will start my own family. Start Get our own family. Gonna start my own family with hookers and blackjack. <laughs> Forget the blackjack. So they split ways, with Shinji keeping the 100 million for the client and making sure the cops don't show up, whilst Kiryu heads to the bar Serena to meet with Nishiki. He sounds like he's going to be important later. Yeah, maybe, I don't know. On the way there, he bumps into another Yakuza member, who tries to fight Kiryu out of a perceived lack of respect. I love it, it's like, you, you just have to assume that every person you bump into is a member of the Mafia. <laughs> every single person. If not the Mafia, they're just incredibly aggressive. I mean, that's, that's basically just the random encounters. Get out of here! After the fight is over, a man in a snakeskin jacket with an eye patch shouts out to Kiryu-chan and tells the goon that he picked a fight with the Dragon of Dojima. I wonder what his name is. Yeah, no one knows who this character is. This is none other than Goro Majima, the captain of the Shimano family, nicknamed the Mad Dog of Shimano. Wait, so one guy's a dragon and another guy's just a mad dog. Well, it's a case of the dragon is supposed to reflect how Kiryu's like this unstoppable force of nature. Meanwhile, Majima's nickname is supposed to transfer that he's fucking crazy. He's wearing snakeskin, of course he's crazy. He mentions how Kiryu's sweetheart works at Serena, but more importantly is disappointed in Kiryu, viewing him letting the thug go after beating him up as too soft. Imagine letting go of the guy that you've just beaten to half death. SMH can't be me. Speaking of half death, Majima then proceeds to beat the man half to death with an umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> wow, weapon of choice. What a coincidence. 
So yeah, Majima proceeds to beat the guy half to death with an umbrella, with Kiryu stopping him right before he stabs the guy in the face with the umbrella's tip. Majima backs off, though he does tell Kiryu that if he's going to run his own family, he's got to learn how to discipline them. Oh god, that's not- this isn't the message we should be encouraging. I didn't know Majima was into that stuff, I- I- it's uh, uh... I mean, in addition to the snakeskin jacket, he's also wearing leather trousers, so... Yeah, okay, now I see it. <laughs> anyway, moving on from Majima's kicks, Kiryu finally gets to Serena, where he meets the barmaid, Reina, and fellow Dojima family member, Akira Nishikiyama. Nishiki asks Kiryu how the deal with getting his own family is going, and whilst Kiryu is slightly hesitant, stating it hasn't gone through yet, Nishiki is confident it will, thanks to the backing of Kazama, who is pretty much the only thing keeping the Dojima family afloat. Is carrying the weight of the entire. I was going to say franchise, but that doesn't make any sense. Yes, the Dodgem of Family franchise, the most beloved entertainment series. <laughs> With him also throwing in some jabs about how all Dodgem does is talk about his glory days and comments on how Kiri was one upping him again. Back in my day, we were the most powerful family in the entirety of Japan. <laughs> the conversation turns to Nishiki's sister. With him saying she's up for another surgery next month, and given how her health is turning, it could end up being the last one. At which point, Yumi shows up, and the four spend the night drinking together, with Kiryu eventually falling asleep. Who went for the surgery? Who went asking for, like, surgery? Oh, that's uh, Nishiki's sister. You never see her on screen. <laughs> Nishiki is just like, like, oh, wow, Kiryu, I'm, sh I'm sure glad that you're upstaging me again with your power eyes through this family that I fucking hate the leader of. <laughs> and then Kiryu's just like, ah, I'm not interested in that. Anyway, how is your dying sister? That seems like an appropriate time to bring that up. So, Kiryu wakes up at 4pm the next day and heads to the Kazama family office. Oh, relatable. As you do after a long night drinking. <laughs> Where he meets with Shintaro Kazama, the family's patriarch, which is a subsidiary of the Dojima family. Nice moustache. I think he's one of like the first characters in the series who was played by like an actual Yakuza film actor. I love how the first thing you said was a <laughs> nice moustache. As well as Osamu Kashiwagi, the Kazama family captain. There's no moustache, so I don't even care. No, but he has the, <laughs> like, face scar that goes from, like, his left cheek all the way across his nose. But anyway, so Kiryu hands over the money he got from the raid yesterday. Kazama basically checks on Kiryu just to make sure he's not being too reckless, as the members of a family follow in the example of their patriarch. Don't be reckless like we were ten years ago. <laughs> you keep predicting the plot because... <laughs> Kashiwagi reassures him that Kiri is fine, though he does step a bit out of line when he brings up Kazama's past as the Tojo clan's most successful assassin. Kazama asks to speak one-on-one -on -one with Kiryu, where in addition to being proud of Kiryu's rise through the ranks, we also learn that Kazama is Kiryu, Nishiki, and Yumi's foster father, running the orphanage they all grew up in. Sunflower Orphanage. Sunflower Orphanage. That's wholesome. It's better than peace. Bank or whatever it was called, I forget. Peace finance. Don't worry, you don't have to remember anymore. After this, it comes completely irrelevant outside of like, I think like one sub story in Yakuza 3. Good, I, I hate peace finance. I don't even know who they are, but I hate them. Suddenly, there's a call to the Kazama family office. It's Shinji, and he's got an urgent message for Kiri. Dojima has taken Yumi by force, and Nishiki has already headed to the office to try and save her. Oh no. But I think we can all see where this is going. Despite Kazama's urges not to go, Kiri rushes to the office to save the people he considers family. <laughs> Fast and Furious. Yeah, that's like one of the overarching themes of the series, that um, family is not... Uh, by blood or whatever, it's who you choose to make your family. Oh, found family. We love that trope. Mm. We do love that trope. We love to see it. Kiryu arrives, finding that Nishiki has already killed Dojima, gunning him down after he tried to sexually assault Yumi. Oh, okay, fair enough. I was like, yeah, I think oh, we no, I don't know. I was like, yeah, actually, <laughs> Like, yeah, it's a case fine. of we don't know anything about Dojima outside of the fact that he tried to assault someone, so... Well... That's all you need to know, really. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Say no more. Say Just... no more. Kiryu tells Nishiki to escape with Yumi, saying if Nishiki goes to prison now, he can't be with his sister when she needs him most. And despite some pushback, Nishiki eventually leaves with Yumi, 
Kiryu taking the fall for the murder of Sohei Dojima. After seeing the intro scene of Kiryu getting arrested, we cut to him being interrogated, where Kiryu insists he killed Dojima over money disputes. However, Makoto Date, the detective in charge of Kiryu's case, doesn't buy it for a second. However, Date's higher-up tells him that given it's an inner dispute between Yakuza, it doesn't matter if Kiryu's lying or not, as long as they can close the case as fast as possible. <laughs> they just don't even care. It's just... Yeah, it's literally a case of, we don't want to get involved with Yakuza disputes. I don't give a shit if he's lying. Just accept it as truth. I don't care. Before Date leaves, Kiryu asks if he could give Yumi's ring to Kazama and tell him that he's sorry. Date telling Kiryu he's pushing his luck, but he'll see what he can do. Well, that's just sad. Ultimately, Kerry was sentenced to 10 years for murder, where soon after being sentenced, he gets a visit from Shinji, giving Kiryu a letter of expulsion. Confusing Kiryu as killing a patriarch should result in a permanent ban from the clan. 10 years is surprisingly tame, I feel like. Yeah, no, that's... Yeah. I mean, it's fairly light sentencing. I guess they just figured, eh, he killed a crime boss. But yeah, Kiryu's basically confused because killing Dojima should have given him a permanent banishment from the clan. However, Shinji says that the Tojo clan's chairman was the one who decided on expulsion. It's an inside job, I, I think. I wonder who, 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 whatever is... I, I, I wonder if someone's <laughs> plotting something. <laughs> <laughs> he also tells Kiryu that due to Dojima being killed, the remnants of the Dojima family will be absorbed into the Kazama family. So Kiryu's visit time ends, but right before he leaves, Shinji gives one last message. Yumi has gone missing since the day after Dojima was shot, and after the shooting, she couldn't remember Kiryu or Nishiki. Oh no. So basically, she got amnesia, and the next day she vanished. And currently, both Nishiki and Kazama are trying to figure out where she went. The plot thickens. <laughs> I wonder who could have taken her. We then cut to meal time, where Kiryu ends up getting attacked by a hitman from within the prison. At least has a job, at least, in prison. Dojima Oyabun will see you in hell! <laughs> After being defeated, tells Kiryu that the order to kill Kiryu came from the Tojo chairman. Let's just reveal all our secrets just by losing. However, before Kiryu can properly process what he's been told, he gets knocked out by a guard. Ugh, go figure. Uh, and that's the end of chapter one. That was a lot. No, it certainly was. It was like Phoenix Wright or something. There was like elements of Phoenix Wright the side of murder. I like how the scene kind of like starts with the murder and then it progressively loops back to explain how we got there. <laughs> like you have the enticing scene and then you have the, yep, that's me. I bet you're wondering how I got here. And then we figure out how we got there. Oh my God, full circle. Whoa. It's like a script. Now that's storytelling. There's one thing that I don't, that I'm a bit confused about. So was it the head of the Tojo clan who said that Kiryu was just going to be expelled? Yeah. And that same head of the Tojo clan also um, ordered for Kiryu to be murdered in the prison. Yes. Huh. It's all connected. Do you want to know the best thing? What? Go on. They don't explain that in the main story. They only explained it in a sub story that was added in the remake. Oh. Oh. Uh, well, they didn't even include it in the original. As far as I'm aware, no. I'll put up a thing on screen if it turns out I'm wrong, but as far as I'm aware, they do not explain it in the original PS2 game. Oh, who cares about loose threads, I suppose. Chapter 2, December 5th, 2005. 10 years gone. We jump forward 10 years. Again, you could not figure that out from the title based on the fact that it's gone from 1995 to 2005 and that uh, it's 10 years gone. <laughs> What's the difference between 2005 and 1995? Oh god. We jump forward 10 years, and it's the day before Kiryu was released on parole. That's nice. He's a good little murderer. He didn't murder someone, he just took the fall for it. 
Well, for all the, the public knows, he's a murderer. Okay, fair enough. Kiri receives a letter in the mail from Kazama. <laughs> Kazama? Yeah, his criminal dad. Cut to a meeting at Tojo HQ. First seeing Kazama arrive, with him being quickly followed by Futoshi Shimano, the patriarch of the Shimano family. Whoa. <laughs> oh god, that jump scared me. <laughs> <laughs> Shimano jump scare. Mr. Clean looks worse than I thought. <laughs> Oh god. We then see the third chairman, Masaru Sera, arrive in the meeting room, saying the meeting was called by their colleague, Nishiki, who is now the patriarch of the Nishikiyama family. He got his own family, good for him. Nishiki claims he called the meeting to inquire about how all 10 billion yen of the clan's cash reserves held in Toto Bank has gone missing. No, all my worldly possessions. This causing discussion between the patriarchs before Shimano gets up to tell them to shut the fuck up and threatens Nishiki by saying that if he's lying, he's losing more than a finger. What a toxic workplace. God, how are criminals so toxic? <laughs> I know, they're so toxic. Like, I'd have to be friends. Sarah asks Nishiki what his source is. Nishiki claiming it came from Torada, the chief of HQ of the Omi Alliance, a rival clan from Kansai. So Sarah confirms the money has been stolen, states that HQ are already handling it, and adjourns the meeting. But many of the Patriarchs are now furious at this news, especially Shimano. I was pissing off all the dads. Basically. Not what you want to do. We cut back to Kiryu reading Kazama's letter. It states that in the 10 years Kiryu's been gone, the Tojo has changed. He can't meet Kiryu when he's released, but needs to talk to him about what's happened to both Yumi and Nishiki. I was gonna say, it's just not the same anymore. Nishiki slicks his hair back. He doesn't even use gel. I don't know how it sticks back there. With him also instructing Kiryu to meet Kazuki, the owner of a host club called Stardust. However, before Kiryu enters the club, he's stopped by a host, who, based on Kiryu's appearance, assumes he's a Yakuza planning to threaten the club for protection money, with him refusing to let a Yakuza tear down what Kazuki built on his own, leading to a fight. Of course. <laughs> you know, just like, you see, you're at your club, a guy rocks up in a suit, and you immediately assume he's Yakuza. So your, your drip is too good, you must leave. You're not coming in here, you fucking asshole! Eventually, the commotion causes Kazuki to step outside to figure out what all the noise is, with them both letting Kiryu in and letting us know the host who fought Kiryu is named Yuya. The two apologize to Kiryu, Yuya for assuming he was still a Yakuza, and Kazuki for not informing Yuya about Kiryu in the first place. Kazuki tells Kiryu that Kazama was the one who taught him how to run his club, without the need for paying protection money to the Yakuza, with him wanting to use Stardust as a way to meet Kiryu without anyone else in the Tojo finding out. Kiryu asks where he is, with Kazuki stating they try to contact him, but he's tied up recently. Because the Tojo clan chairman was murdered the previous night, with no one knowing who did it. So yeah, we've just seen the chairman for like one cutscene, and then like two cutscenes later, he's dead. Oh wow. Wow. It's not as fast as Dojima literally dying in like the first cutscene. No, but it's very close. It's very close. He also states a turf war between the Tojo families has started to break out, thanks to a shift in power due to a betrayal within the Kazama family, who had previously been helping the Dojima family keep power in the area. There's a Judas. There's a mole. There's a mole. But before Kazuki can tell Kiryu who exactly the betrayer in the family is, some goons from the Shimano family barge into Stardust, causing a fuss due to Yuya constantly claiming they're here just to try and get protection money. Ah, the goons. The goons. There's always some convenient interruption before important information is revealed. Well, yeah, how else are you going to fit in the action sequences? <laughs> Kazuki tries to defuse the situation by mentioning they have a guest and offering some money. However, Yuya keeps going with his mockery towards the Shimano members, until one of them tries to hit Yuya over the head with a glass bottle, at which point Kiryu steps in to kick the shit out of the Shimano family members. God damn it, Yuya. <laughs> For God's sake, he just can't keep his mouth shut, can he? To be fair, look how massive his mouth is. No wonder he can keep his shut. <laughs> <laughs> Don't diss him too much. I like Yuya. He's cool. Hey, fuck this place up! Let's rip this motherfucker down! 
After the fight, one of them pulls out a gun, finally recognizing Kiryu and realizing by killing him, he could improve his standings with Shimano. However, before he can shoot Kiryu, he's shot in the hand by Shinji, who is now a lieutenant, who then presses the gun against the guy's head, reminding him that Stardust isn't Shimano territory and that if he's caught here again, he will be killed. It'll be both hands. We'll shoot them both next time. Yeah, and then you can have the stigmata, like, Jesus. Ikiri then continues his discussion with Kazuki, where he learns the Kazami family traitor is Nishiki. Oh my god. Oh, I'll go figure. Of course it's Nishiki. He's aiming to go independent with his backing from Tarada. Shinji reveals that Kazama suspected Nishiki being a traitor, and so made Shinji the Nishikiyama family's lieutenant advisor in order to monitor the Nishiki family. Kiryu still wants to meet Kazama himself, however Shinji says he won't be able to leave Tojo HQ due to Sarah's funeral being held there the next day, with him also adding that Sarah was killed right after everyone found out about the 10 billion yen being stolen. Seeing only one option, Kiryu decides to try and sneak into Tojo HQ during the funeral to meet Kazama. And it goes incredibly well and nothing bad happens. Exactly. I mean, we can end the story here. There's still like another 11 chapters, but let's just end after two. Chapter three, Funeral of Fists. I, every time you say, whenever I hear that, I just imagine like a coffin filled with hands. <laughs> and just like a, just like an audience of handless people just in mourning over their fist. Shimano is getting his head shaved whilst his goons tell him what went down at Stardust, apologizing for their failures. Though Shimano seems more interested in the fact Kiryu's in town, with him cutting two fingers from the group's leader, commenting the guy's lucky that he's in a good mood. Kiryu shows up at Tojo HQ. The plan to meet Kazama is to enter the front entrance under the disguise of being a guest for the funeral, after which he'll meet Shinji at the back entrance he'll take him to meet Kazama. I just imagine like, oh, how did you know her? And it's like, oh, uh, um, I, um, <laughs> just doesn't answer. However, on the way to the back entrance, he runs into a guy from the Omi Alliance who has been hired by Nishiki to capture Kiryu. Though he manages to fight him off, and when he asks Shinji about it, apparently he had no idea about Nishiki's plan. Ugh, Nishiki. Nishiki. Very long name. Just be glad I'm not calling him Nishikiyama every time. This is the dragon of the Dojima family? What a little pussy. Kiryu is led to a room where Kazama is later brought in. He tells Kiryu that after Dojima was killed, due to his sister dying, Kiryu going to prison, and Yumi disappearing, Nishiki became a changed man. His only ambition being to rise through the ranks of the Toja regardless of the cost, with there being nothing anyone, not even Kazama, could do to stop him. To be fair, after everything has went to shit, I, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> Kazama also begins telling Kiryu about Yumi. But before he can say anything, Kazama is shot by a sniper. Go figure. A group of Tojo men burst into the room alongside Shimano, who immediately blame Kiryu for Kazama getting shot. Shimano sending them in to kill Kiryu. How dare you try to advance the plot? You know what happens when you do that. <laughs> He tries to fight them off, but more keep coming in. Kazama tells Kiryu to escape and find both Yumi and the missing 10 billion. Kiryu then jumps out the window and proceeds to fight his way through the Tojo HQ. Using nothing but his fists. Or any other weapons he brought along. As well as whatever random shit he grabs around the building. <laughs> He just ended that sentence out and he just jumps out the window. <laughs> <Me>. <laughs> Credits. Ending with a fight against Shimano himself at the front entrance. I was like, oh no, a group of people. Oh no. Call an ambulance, but not for me. <laughs> <laughs> As Kiryu runs for the exit, he looks back and catches a glimpse of Nishiki, who simply smirks and walks away.
chapter three is a lot shorter because a majority of it is just carries I guess sneaking through the front entrance and then like the long battle through the HQ to get out. All that scene was missing was like fire. You know when he smirks and looks away, just like fire. There's a pillow of fire between them. Yeah, it just needs the Sephiroth fire. I will take this opportunity to talk about the one, like one of the main complaints people had for Yakuza 1. Nishiki's villain turn having like no impact because we barely know him because before he turns into a villain. <laughs> like literally, what did we know about Nishiki before he became a villain? He was brothers with Kiryu. And he has a sister who's like getting surgery. That's basically, yeah. Yeah, we really don't have anything else to go on for Nishiki. I think it's literally a case of they wanted it to be like a surprising twist of Nishiki's the bad guy, but they forgot to set up Nishiki actually being a character. It just, it happened during the time skip. We'll just skip past all the character traits and all the reasons why you turn evil is that you know what we'll just like skip it and just like oh it's evil now the remake uh yakuza kwami tried to address that by adding like a bunch of extra scenes that try to better explain it which basically boils down to everyone in the universe just shits on nishiki professional l taker basically <laughs> nishiki basically becomes the professional l taker until he finally embraces just being a murderer you can only take so many l's before you become an edgelord I think it's a case of Nishiki was originally a really weak villain, but they kind of improved him with both the remake as well as the prequel game Zero, which obviously since that's a prequel, he's a good guy in that game. Yeah. Well, he has what every villain needs, a stereotypical smirk and a walk away. Chapter 4, An Encounter. <gasps> I wonder there's going to be an encounter. A wild Pokemon is appeared. <laughs> Kiryu finally gets out of Tojo HQ, only to get surrounded by more Tojo men. But before they can attack Kiryu, a car speeds down the road, the driver demanding Kiryu jump in. It is fast and furious, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Kiryu agreeing due to seeing no other options. Like, it's literally either I get in this car with this guy I potentially don't know, or I have to fight more people. After making enough distance, Kiryu gets up and gets a glance at the getaway driver. It's Date, the detective who was put in charge of investigating Dojima's murder. After getting back to Kamurocho, they go to the bar Bacchus. I thought you said Barkers and it was like a dog hotel or something. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I heard Kiryu Barkers, starring like... in a hotel for dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Kiryu asks why Date saved him. Date revealing that after continuing to look into Kiryu's case despite his guilty plea, the Tokyo PD gave him an unwanted transfer from homicide to organized crime, being viewed as a nuisance by the police, with him even getting divorced by his wife. So Date is now set as the detective to investigate the murder of Sarah, and he wants Kiryu's help due to Kiryu's release happening around the same time that both the 10 billion disappeared and the chairman was murdered. That is, it's just a coincidence. It's fine. Those two very specific events had no correlation, obviously. Obviously. He gives Kiryu a mobile phone, with them agreeing that Date will look into the 10 billion, whilst Kiryu looks into where Yumi went. Date believing there to be a link between the two. Maybe Yumi stole the 10 billion. Kiryu decides to begin his investigation by going over to Serena in order to ask Reina if she knows anything about what happened to Yumi. Reina doesn't know much other than she disappeared from the hospital. However, five years ago, a woman named Mizuki showed up claiming to be Yumi's sister. Though Yumi didn't know her due to being separated from her family at birth. Mizuki told Reina that she was going to follow in her sister's footsteps and open her own bar named Ares. Really cool name for a bar, I can't lie. Though after that, Reina hasn't heard from her since and doesn't know where the bar is, with Reina also mentioning that Mizuki looked almost identical to Yumi, the main difference being a flower tattoo around her left shoulder. She then recommends Kiryu go back to Bacchus to ask the owner where Ares is, as he knows where all the bars in town are. However, when Kiryu gets there, the bar owner, along with a few patrons, have been massacred. Oh my god. Oh dear. And as Kiryu walks through, he hears some panicked breathing. He looks around the corner to see a young girl holding a gun in fear. Oh, she's the murderer. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. She has a gun. Kiryu grabs it and asks the girl if she knows what happened, but apparently all the people were dead by the time she got here. He then asks why she's here, 
the girl saying she's trying to find her mum. I'd be more thinking, why does she have the gun? <laughs> I don't know, she probably found it. Kiryu leaves the bar with the kid, at which point they then see a group of punks throwing rocks at a stray dog. <laughs> with Kiryu interfering and proceeding to beat the shit out of them in order to release his anger. And now we're getting into John Wick territory, I see. Except in this case, the dog doesn't die. That would be too much, I'm afraid. Yeah, that'd be too far. I can excuse human massacres and bars, but I draw the line, animal cruelty. I think you're the unlucky one, old man. Kiryu tries to get more info out of the kid, with him finding out that, like Kiryu, she's an orphan and that her name is Haruka, though she refuses to continue the conversation until they get something to feed the dog. After doing so, Kiryu asks if she's from an orphanage, how is she so confident that she'll find her mother in Kamurocho? Apparently Haruka received letters from her mum, though she hasn't met her before, with the only relative she does know being her aunt, Yumi. Oh. Oh. Bum, bum, bum. So that attracts the attention of Kiryu, Haruka saying she was the one who gave her the letters, only to soon pass out, with Kiryu basically taking her to Sereno, whilst also telling Date what happened over the phone. Just fill him in over the phone, he doesn't need to be directly involved. I'm, I'm not gonna lie, these plot twists are becoming less and less predictable. With Date then in turn telling Reina, basically they reckon Haruka had a fever from the shock of what she saw in the bar just like finally catching up. Haruka eventually wakes up after taking some medicine and rest, with it turning out the stray dog also followed them to Serena. Aw, that's nice. So then Kiryu then asks questions about the Haruka's aunt Yumi, and after learning that Haruka grew up from Sunflower Orphanage, and that her mother is Mizuki, they quickly realise that Haruka is the niece of the Yumi, Kiryu, and Reina now. Wait, they only just realise that? Well, they needed confirmation, because there's more than just one person named Yumi. Uh, okay, fair enough. Haruka asks if Kiryu will help her look for Mizuki, with Haruka saying she knows where Ares is. Kiryu agreeing to go with Haruka to Ares, the bar turning out to be on the top floor of the Millennium Tower, with a specific button combination being needed to reach the floor on the elevator. Haruka knowing it thanks to the letters from Mizuki. So after seeing a picture of Mizuki in the bar, Kiryu asks Haruka if her mother was still alive and in contact with Haruka, why exactly was she in an orphanage? Oh, that's actually a very good question. <laughs> yeah. Parak is saying the only explanation she was ever given was her mum couldn't come get her, not giving a proper explanation any time Haruka wrote a letter asking why, with Yumi later giving Haruka a locket from Mizuki the last time they met, which led Haruka to believe she'd never get to meet her mother. Oh, damn. Oh, that's sad. Suddenly, a bunch of Omi Alliance Yakuza enter the bar, led by Hiroshi Hayashi, the lieutenant advisor of the Omi. Of course, the plot's happening, so we need to be interrupted again. Kiryu assuming they were sent by Nishiki. Fucking Nishiki! Oh. Kiryu then gets a call from Date, who reveals that the person who stole the 10 billion was Yumi. Oh. With Yumi's ring, the same one Kiryu picked up at the shooting of Dojima, being found at the crime scene. The Tojo trying to find both her and Mizuki. Okay, f f f I was kidding when I said that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Kiryu then fights off the Omi men after finding out they weren't sent to get Kiryu, Yumi, or Mizuki, instead being here to get Haruka. Go! Kill this arrogant motherfucker! <laughs> with both her and Kiryu being confused as to why they'd want Haruka. Not yet, at least. It seems like all of the all of my joke predictions end up becoming true. <laughs> <laughs> so what else is gonna happen? Alien invasion, and then something happens next chapter. No, don't worry. Alien invasion doesn't happen until Lost Judgment. <laughs> wow, you can really say anything, and chances are it probably happened. Yeah, that's why this series is great. Zombies. No, that's just um, Yakuza Dead Souls, the zombie spinoff. Oh, oh okay. Still. <laughs> like there actually is a zombie game. Wow. Okay.
<laughs> Getting back on track to Yakuza 1, any overarching thoughts on any of the characters or the story so far? I I think Kiryu is a he's a he's become a lot more compelling since the end of chapter two. Nishiki I can't take seriously. <laughs> I have the mental image of him smirking and walking away in a pill of fire and now I just can't. <laughs> I know the pull of fire didn't happen, but I, I just can't imagine it. It's just so cliche. <laughs> uh, it's so cliche. <laughs> Chapter 5, Purgatory. We're getting religious now, ooh. Back at Serena, Kiryu fills in Date about all the info they have on Yumi and Mizuki, with them then receiving a call on the bar's phone. This turning out to be Shinji, who's currently on the run with an unconscious Kazama. What? Due to him believing that, given the circumstances, he must have been shot by someone within the Tojo. He's just, he's just like, you would not believe the death. <laughs> you would not oh believe what I've had to deal with since you oh wrecked shit. <laughs> you would not believe my, the day I've had today. Jeez <laughs> Louise. With no other leads, Date suggests they look for the legendary information broker, the Florist of Psy. Named so due to him delivering his information on cards with flowers, with him apparently knowing everything that goes down in the city, despite almost no one knowing what he looks like. Well, at least he gives flowers, that's nice. I hope it's roses. Anyway, so the florist is apparently based near West Park, a shut down park that was overtaken by Camarocho's homeless population, the place also going by the name Purgatory. Why? Why Purgatory? I don't know. I, I guess because it's just the place you go when you're homeless. It, it also sounds kind of cool. Yeah, that as well. Don't go to the park, you'll feel dead inside, essentially. So Kiri decides to head over with Date agreeing to look after Haruka. Though after surveying the area, the only place that seems to connect to West Park is a public bathroom. However, when Kiri enters, he gets cornered by a group of homeless people with guns. They're not wanting any business with the Yakuza. Stay out of our public bathrooms. Before things go south, one of the homeless men gets a call, being told to let Kiryu into West Park via a door behind the last stall. On the other side of the door is a large American man who already knows Kiryu's name, the man guiding Kiryu through the park to an underground stairwell, saying the boss is at the end. The stairs leading to a secret underground gambling and pleasure den filled with wealthy businessmen. This being what purgatory really is. At the end of the area, Kiryu finds the building the florist is in, who is already familiar with Kiryu's history. Kiryu wants info on the missing 10 billion, as well as both Yumi and Mizuki. The florist explains his info isn't cheap, as thanks to his network of security cameras and homeless people, he knows about everything that happens in town. Kiryu's stating that whilst he can't pay him now, he needs the information as soon as possible. The florist explains that he hates the Yakuza, but is interested in Kiryu due to him taking on the Tojo. However, in order to keep up his reputation, he can't give out information for free. So he makes Kiryu a deal. If he can win a three-match tournament in Purgatory's underground Colosseum, he can use the prize money to buy the florist's information. So Kiri agrees with him fighting the American fugitive Daniel Feldman, a former Muay Thai world champion, Giao Wayan Pramuk, I hope I pronounced that right, <laughs> and the Coliseum's champion, Gary Buster Holmes. He's actually the guy who guided Kiri to the entrance of Purgatory. Gary Holmes sounds so British. No, Gary Buster Holmes is like American. That's what. That's the thing. It's like it sounds like the name of like a guy from Manchester. <laughs> we, we, <laughs> I definitely probably know that Gary Holmes in up north. I, I can guarantee you that. So Kiri holds off his end of the bargain, wins the tournament. So then the florist tells Kiryu that Sarah was covering up that the money had been stolen, with Nishiki exposing the info to the other patriarchs at the emergency meeting we saw back in chapter 2. Based on that, he believes Nishiki is likely the one who killed Sarah, and is likely gunning to become the fourth chairman, as despite the third chairman's death, no successor has been chosen. So the Tojo is now in a civil war where whoever gets the 10 billion first becomes the next chairman. 
I love how being a chairman is worth more than 10 billion. He also confirms that Yumi was the one who stole the 10 billion, with the Tojo investigation finding out Mizuki closed down Ares and disappeared right before the money got stolen. Oh, that's just a coincidence. And given they're both prime suspects and can't be found, that's why the Omi officers from earlier were after Haruka. Basically, they want Yumi so they can find out where the money is which in turn is why they want Haruka so they can figure out where Yumi is. <laughs> the florist also reveals that a masked woman came in to ask where a girl called Haruka was two days ago. And it didn't seem suspicious at all. Though he couldn't tell if it was Yumi or Mizuki based on what he could see of her face. And because he doesn't work with secretive clients, he turned her away. Understandable. Fair enough. I feel like someone came up with a mask just to my door. I would just not answer it. The florist then gets a call saying a guest has arrived for Kiryu, with him taking Kiryu to his monitor room filled with security footage of Kamarocho. The florist explaining that the police had previously installed 50 cameras to try and catch terrorist activity, but weren't successful. So logically, the florist installed 10,000 cameras for his business. So it's above and beyond. Yeah. yeah. Looking at the camera for the public toilet, they see Date, who's bleeding. Is, is Date also taking a shit while bleeding? Because you might just... No. <laughs> no. <laughs> These are the important questions. <laughs> Rewinding the footage by 10 minutes, they find he was assaulted and shot by a group of thugs who kidnapped Haruka, with Date now being in danger of getting assaulted by the homeless living in West Park. Well, obviously he got shot as the accuser. I don't think he'd be lying on the floor bleeding just by tripping over. I don't know. <laughs> Kiryu rushes off to save Date, buying off the homeless when they refuse to back off due to Date being a car. Back off homeless people. You all want to kill him so bad? You won't mind coming through me first. Oh. The florist arriving after the fight to tell Kiryu that the thugs that took Haruka stopped off at the batting center, with Date recognizing the florist as an ex-cop who got fired for leaking police intel, Date being the one who reported him. He also tells Kiryu that the people who took Haruka were from the Majima family. What? Yeah, Majima kidnapped Haruka. That is... Okay. Kiryu heads over to the fan cages. Upon arrival, the lights turn on and some of the ball throwing machines turn on, with Majima along with several Majima family goons walking out. Majima talking about how happy he is with the opportunity to fight Kiryu, saying it'll be a fight to the death. Only for Majima to get hit in the face with a baseball. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. After an awkward silence, Majima starts laughing with his men joining in, except for one. Majima then proceeded to beat up the guy who didn't laugh with a baseball bat. How dare you not laugh at my jokes? Kiryu yells at him to stop and give back Haruka. Majima then saying the only way he's getting Haruka is if Kiryu defeats him. You can't be serious, but I am. I'm always deadly serious. Come on, <laughs> let's do this. You think you can take me, Kazuma-chan? Get ready. To get fucked up. Kiryu was able to fight off the Majima family, the mad dog even giving Kiryu some respect. However, whilst Kiryu's back is turned, a Majima family man sprints towards him with a knife. But at the last second, Majima gets in the way of the knife, claiming that Kiryu belongs to him, and because of that, only he is allowed to kill Kiryu before passing out with the Majima family quickly rushing to take Majima to the hospital. He's mine. Haruka then comes out of the room she was held in and hugs Kiryu, talking about how scared she was, Kiryu apologizing for not getting there faster. Returning to Serena, Date is sorry for not being able to protect Haruka. Haruka says she was tied up, but after a loud noise, a man she didn't recognize came into the room, untied her, and told her to run. After Haruka thanked him, he asked if she still had the pendant given to her by Yumi, with there also being a flashback to the scene to when Haruka got the pendant, Yumi instructing her not to tell others about it and to keep hold of it. With the stranger not wanting the pendant, but telling Haruka to look after it, due to it being worth 10 billion yen. Oh. Oh. oh! The pendant can't be opened without a key, which Haruka doesn't have, with her refusing to let it be opened by breaking it. 
because it's basically like the only thing she has of her mum. So, oh, uh, of course, it's a MacGuffin. That's what we needed right now. Yeah, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Kiryu asked if Haruka remembers what the man looks like, but apparently it was too dark to see his face. However, he did instruct her to tell Kiryu about the pendant. So whilst Kiryu doesn't know who it is, yeah. the man knows who Kiryu is. I, chapter 5 was really fucking cool, I have to say. What part of did, did you prefer? Did you prefer the purgatory part or basically the Majima part? Uh, the purgatory part was quite interesting. It was some very cool uh, world building. Um, and the Majima fight was nice comic relief. Yeah, true. It just gets knocked out by a baseball. I think in general with Majima, Yakuza 1 Majima is just crazy bad guy. Yakuza 2, that is when they try to soften him and try to make him just more funny than evil. Yeah. And then Yakuza 3 is when they start making him an actual person. <laughs> Chapter 6, Father and Child. Oh yeah, so just to break narration a little bit, this is basically just like one of those breather chapters story games sometimes do, where they basically put the story on hold for a bit so they can expand on some of the themes and characters. Oh, cool. Family drama, what a completely unexplored topic of, of genre. Yeah, so, so effectively, this is technically a filler chapter, but oh well, deal with it. I, I've watched Naruto, I've had my fair share of filler. <laughs> okay, so returning to the business at hand. Since Haruka is safe again, Kiryu decides to hit the town. But after leaving, he's approached by one of the homeless men who works for the florist, asking Kiryu if he can see him, as the florist seems to be in a bad mood because of something involving his estranged family, namely his son, who has never met the florist, Takashi. Kiryu heads over, and he catches the florist watching his son, who's currently at the batting cages alongside his girlfriend, Kyoka, who is the daughter of the patriarch of a Yakuza group from Asakusa called the Atobe family, or the Atobe family. I think Artebe is. I don't know how well it's correct. I cannot believe you're butchering these names. That's. Yeah, how dare I, an Englishman, butcher Japanese names? Punishable by death. Anyway, so Kiryu decides to head over to the batting center, where Takashi then attacks Kiryu, telling Kyoko to run away, having confused Kiryu for a member of the Artebe family. And the first thing you do is attack. That seems like a very healthy way to handle the problem. There's a theme going on in Yakuza where anyone who's wearing a suit just gets assaulted. <laughs> and you're not gonna stop me! After Kiryu calms him down with a fight and explains he's not one of them, Takashi explains that they're being hunted down by the Atabe family due to Kyoka running away from home to be with him, with Takashi deciding he should head after Kyoka, who ran off to Club Debola. However, before he can leave, the gang he used to be a part of, the Bee Kings, enter the bank center, piss at Takashi for announcing him leaving the group with a text message. Kiryu stepping in, saying he'll fight them whilst Takashi leaves to meet Kyoka. I was gonna say the Bee King. Like, okay, Jerry Seinfeld. <laughs> <laughs> oh, That's the oh, secret, God. they're actually Barry B. Benson. Oh god. <laughs> Yeah, no wonder Takashi left. Oh god. After beating them, Kiryu tells the group's leader to leave Takashi alone, but the gang leader says he's screwed anyway, since the bag Kyoka had was filled with her father's money, which is likely from the family funds. So Kiryu decides to follow Takashi to Debola, where he and Kyoka are surrounded by Atabe family members, who are convinced that Takashi is a punk trying to scam Kyoka, with him eventually stepping up to defend himself and Kyoka, with Kiryu then coming in to take on the Atabe family men himself. Shut your mouth! Take your ass out of here! You wanna fucking die? You got some set of balls. You know you're outnumbered. Get your fucking hands off oh, me! Me! Go! This conversation's over. Kill him. Yes, yes, sir. yes sir. After the fight, Kiryu tells Takashi to leave the cache and get out. 
Though Kyoko quickly gets upset about how her father ruined her life and chants at friendships at a young age due to him being a Yakuza. And after Takashi makes a plea that despite his previous living of a gang's errand boy, he'd try his hardest to start over and make a decent living for Kyoko. Aww, redemption arc. <laughs> nice. <laughs> At which point one of the Atebe family men reads a letter from Kyoka's father, stating that despite his strength as a Yakuza patriarch, he failed to make his only daughter happy, with him giving his blessing to leave with Takashi, with it being revealed that Kyoka's father was watching the whole time from the florist's monitor room. Kiri realising the whole thing was basically a test to see if Takashi was worthy of Kyoka. Uh... Look, you may be a crime boss, but you don't make me happy anymore. Kyoko's father takes his leave, asking the florist if he's okay with the relationship given his deep hatred of the Yakuza, and that Takashi is a good kid. The florist stating he's just the father of the girl his son likes, and that whilst he agrees, he can't take any credit for how Takashi turned out, the Yakuza saying the same for Kyoko. <laughs> that, was, that was kind of a cute little side chapter, I can't lie. It's like a side quest. Yeah, that's... That, that's Probably why I'd say my problem with chapter six is it kind of feels like they took two sub stories and just made it mandatory story content. <laughs> anyway, so after that whole ordeal, Kiryu heads over to Serena where Date is passed out drunk. His phone then gets a call from someone named Saya, and when Kiryu answers, she complains about being stood up by him before hanging up. Reina telling Kiryu that Saya is Date's daughter, and that he was supposed to meet with her in an alley down the street near Public Park. That's not dodgy at all. That's per That sounds perfectly safe, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, basically it's trying to send the message of Date is a deadbeat dad. <laughs> anyway, so when Kiryu heads over there, two high school girls try to proposition him to sleep with them for money. Kiryu turning them down... <laughs> Kiryu turning them down and then reprimanding them after finding out that one of them was Saya, with her quickly storming off. What is it? What the fuck? Did this just happen? Yes. Anyway, Saya's friend then apologizes and says the reason Saya's doing this is because she owes a lot of money to a man named Shotaro, asking Kiryu to help Saya. After looking around, Kiryu finds out that he left his original job in the Champion District to become a host at a Stardust under the name Shota. Once Kiryu gets there, Yuya points out which of the hosts is Shota, at which point Date storms in and yells at Saya for going to a host club and hanging with Shota. Only for Saya to fire back how Date only ever seems to care about her whenever she's doing something wrong, and otherwise doesn't care about her. Saya quickly leaving whilst Date stews in his failures. <laughs> he thinks about his life decisions. Yeah, it's just like, what the fuck did I do? <laughs> How did my daughter end up like this? Saya is soon heard outside panicking with Date springing into action. Saya, having been caught by a group of people she owes money to for her repeat host club visits to Shota. Date punching one of the aggravators when he finds out they plan to sexually exploit Saya, with Kiryu quickly joining the fight alongside Date. Kiryu seems to have a habit of getting involved in other people's shit. Yeah, it's kind of his thing. Get your ass kicked. Date. We'll talk later. <laughs> After beating them up, Date asks where the group's boss is and heads there by himself. Though, after some time passes and he doesn't return, Kiri decides to head there too. But before he leaves, Saya says she was trying to sell herself to him earlier because Shota owed money to Loan Shark soon, with him asking Saya to help. Kiri pointing out if Shota really cared about Saya, he wouldn't have asked her for the money in the first place. Why does everyone owe money to each other? The economy. You know, it's, it's the economy that's been created by the Yakuza. <laughs> and the poor money decisions in the 80s. <laughs> but anyway, so yeah, Kiri's basically like, if Shota really cared about you, he wouldn't have asked you for the money in the first place, and Date is the one who truly cares about you. <laughs> With the two of them basically heading off to the Loan Sharks to meet Date. Over there, Date is getting beat up by the group, with it being revealed that Shota was working with the Loan Sharks the whole time to scam Saya. There's twist after twist. However, they start to panic when they find out Date is with the cops, though Shota sees it as an opportunity to get a bunch of confiscated weapons. As Kiryu and Saya reach the outside of the office, they hear Date telling them to kill him, 
that if they do so, in addition to having the police come after them, Saya would be protected by Kiryu. At which point, Kiryu then busts down the door and beats up the loan sharks. Nice. Just another group of people to beat up. So you've been working side by side all this time. You're a bunch of pussies. All of you. Fuck you! After the ordeal, the group meet up again in the park, Date admitting he's been a failure of a father and that he's sorry for running away from Sire and her mother, but Ashi makes one promise, to take better care of herself in order to find any level of happiness, and that if she ever finds herself lost or in need of help, that he'll be there to help her. The two hug as Kiryu makes his exit. Aww. Wow, I feel so warm. We cut to Date at the police station. He's taken by the chief to meet the police commissioner, who requests that Date stop his investigation into the murder of Sarah, bringing up how the last time he continued looking into a case after being told not to with the Dojima's murder, it ruined his career. Despite this, Date heads off anyway. But as he does, it's revealed that Junishi Sudo, the chief superintendent of the organized crime division, was listening in on the conversation, and apparently, Date's friend is a kidnapper, according to members of the top brass, asking they move the case to Division 1. Oh my god. Surprise! There was plot development! They just saved it for the last cutscene! As I said, it's probably like the filler chapter, but I still think it's all right. No, that was that was a fun break from the intensity of the of the rest of the story. Yeah, I'd say that's probably the best thing filler could be, just a fun break from the main story, just to cool down. <laughs> just to warm us up to, for the shit ahead, for the absolute chaos that's going to come. Chapter 7, The Dragon and the Koi. Those are two very different things, a dragon and a fish. Uh, yeah, well, it, it will make sense later, don't worry about it. Date reveals a picture taken of a body pulled out of Tokyo Bay, a woman with the same flower tattoo as Mizuki. The cause of death being concussion and shock from blood loss, coming from torture. So essentially, Mizuki might be dead. Well, that's a very cheery start to the chapter. Kiryu notices some writing under the tattoo, suggesting that it's the work of Utabori II, the same man who did Kiryu's dragon tattoo. So Kiryu decides to pay the man a visit, with him and Date agreeing to hide the picture from Haruka. No one wants to see flowers. Well, it's more so they don't want Haruka to know her mum's dead. Oh yeah, yeah, actually, yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Sorry, that's just, that's just the that's important <laughs> thing. <laughs> that, that kind of like, I just kind of forgot. <laughs> uh, it's been too long. <laughs> We've had a whole chapter where Mizuki's not plot relevant. <laughs> Kiryu goes to visit the guy, and he confirms that whilst the tattoo is his design, namely the Queen of the Night, he wasn't the one who actually inked it. A plagiarism, basically. We don't support plagiarism. Mm. No. As university students, we do not support plagiarism for now. For now. For now. For now. At that moment, Utabori's parlor gets a phone call. It's Nishiki, and he wants to speak to Kiryu. Oh no, the return of yeah. the guy. How, how did Nishiki even know that Kiryu was there? Don't worry, you're about to get your answer. Nishiki gives a very wishy-washy answer as to how he knows Kiryu was there. Go on. Basically, he's just like, I just, no, don't worry about it. He's just the villain that can predict anything, basically. With him asking Kiryu if he knows about Mizuki's death. He then arranges a meeting with Kiryu tomorrow, 10 p.m. at Serena. Of a nice candlelight dinner, you know. Some nice drinks. Some nice, like, orchestral music in the background. Yeah, it'll be nice, it'll be nice. Before Kiryu leaves, Utabori touches up Kiryu's tattoo, telling Kiryu a faded dragon can't defeat Nishiki, whilst explaining the meanings of both Kiryu and Nishiki's tattoos, saying that Kiryu is the powerful rival Nishiki must defeat in order to become a dragon acting as a metaphor for the story of a carp swimming up the Yellow River and crossing mountains to enter the Dragon Gate in order to become a dragon itself. 
Oh, that's cool. A fish becoming a dragon. That's a, that should be a Pixar film. Pretty sure it might be one, actually. We've accidentally leaked the next Pixar film. <laughs> After discussing with Date and Reina about Nishiki's call, they agree to hide Haruka in purgatory before Nishiki arrives due to her being in the Tojo sites. However, Haruka refuses to, questioning why Kiryu left to learn about her mother without her. Basically saying Kiri was only keeping her because he's only after the 10 billion like everyone else. Which causes Kiryu to instinctively slap her. Wow, that's kind of an odd reaction to that. But I mean, how would you feel if someone told you that the only reason you're helping them find the woman you loved is because you're after money? It doesn't really prove her wrong though if he slaps her. To be fair, Kiryu does immediately apologize, but he refuses to tell Haruka what happened, with him even stopping Date from telling her she's dead. Even though we know that he's not like part of it. Like, I don't think she's to be blamed for not knowing that, because that is a bit odd. Haruka then basically tells Kiryu that her mom is pretty much all she has, and if he's just going to do whatever he wants, she will too, with her then leaving the locket at the bar and running away. Oh, great. Kiryu and Date then go on a wild goose chase around Kamurocho trying to figure out where Haruka got to, eventually finding out she got captured in Stardust, with Kazuki and the other employees being tied up in another room. These people hate bars. Yeah. They just hate them. They hate bars and they hate host clubs. With two men in black suits holding Haruka hostage and keeping Kiryu and Date at a distance with a gun, the men request a trade, saying they'll give Haruka back if Kiryu hands over the pendant. When Kiryu tells Haruka this is his fault, as he throws the pendant, Date runs up the stairs to grab Haruka, diving off the balcony as both they and Kiryu are shot at. <laughs> <laughs> Kiryu and Date are safe, however, one of the bullets grazed Haruka's arm. Oh, well, it could have been worse. <laughs> yeah, it could have definitely been worse. More men in black suits show up, at which point Kiryu fights them off. After the fight, Kiryu takes back the pendant and asks them what organization they're from, as the men aren't Yakuza but clearly know about the current situation. But before he can get an answer, the man is shot in the head by one of his associates. Of course, like whenever there's like anything that could, anyone with important information that could further the plot is just dead. Haruka apologizes for causing the situation by running off, at which point Kiryu finally admits to her that Mizuki is dead. Being sorry he couldn't save her, Haruka letting him know it's not his fault. At this point, the Stardust host finally managing to break out, like they only coincidentally got out the exact moment the entire situation got resolved. Maybe they were just hiding in the corner. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> the scene ending with Date taking one of the pins worn by the suited men to see if he can find anything about them. Haruka is then taken to Purgatory, the florist providing a hideout for them to stay in in order to keep Haruka safe. The next day, Date is investigating the murder scene of Sarah, only for Sudo to come in asking why he's here after being removed from the case, with him down talking Date, saying he used to lock up to him but now struggles to figure out what exactly he's doing, letting Date know that he's watching both him and Kiryu as a warning to stop getting involved, Date commenting that Sudo is letting the truth slip through his hands. Kiryu is getting ready to meet with Nishiki, hitting the town with Haruka beforehand and end up exposing the workers of a secret gambling den or cheating the players, afterwards taking Haruka back to Purgatory, asking Date to watch over Haruka while he's out. I kind of sped around that section, it's basically just a filler thing. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's a lot and it doesn't contribute to the story at all. Oh. So that's why I skipped over it in like two sentences. Now I feel better for not under Understanding it. Eh, uh, don't worry. You don't need to. It's it's not plot relevant. <laughs> when Kiryu gets to Serena, Reina says she's staying in the bar during their discussion, out of fear that they'll kill each other if they were by themselves. It's like they're hamsters or something. <laughs> yeah. Nishiki finally meets up with Kiryu after 10 years, him telling Kiryu he needs the 10 billion and requesting he hand over Haruka and the pendant. Kiryu demanding he first explain why Mizuki was murdered. Nishiki saying he didn't mean to, 
In fact, when he found out his men killed her when she refused to talk, he murdered both of them in return, while screaming at them asking who gave the order to kill her. But that was quite the um, evolution of events. He then explains that he's been looking for Yumi for the last 10 years, and he figured by getting Mizuki he'd find a lead, which in turn is how he found out about Haruka. He brings up how Mizuki disappeared around the same time that Tojo's money was stolen, with him bringing out Yumi's ring which was found at the scene proving she's involved, with Nishiki wanting the pendant because he knows Yumi is close, promising he won't do Kiryu wrong. I see, there's a lot happening. Kiryu turns him down as the pendant is is all Haruka has now to remember her mom, adding that he doesn't care about the Tojo civil war. Nishiki saying that kind of attitude is why people like Yumi and people within the Tojo were always drawn to Kiryu. Him not even being sure if he hates Kiryu, but it doesn't really matter due to him having betrayed both Kiryu and Kazama. Nishiki revealing he was the one who shot him back at Sarah's funeral. Oh. What, a, what a very what a terrible time to do that. A funeral. This immediately causes Kiryu to bolt up and punch Nishiki in the face. Fair enough. <laughs> After which, Nishiki then reveals that he knows Kazama is still alive with Shinji him having put a plant on Shinji, saying he can't trust anyone after the incident 10 years ago. This has all just gone so, like, this has gone to shit so Fast. incredibly. <laughs> Nishiki proclaims he will get to the top of the Tojo, and if Kiryu won't hand over Haruka, he'll also be taken down. Kiryu refusing to let her be used as a tool for Nishiki's selfish ambitions, at which point Nishiki declares he and Kiryu are no longer brothers. Well, he's evil anyway, so probably better off. After Nishiki leaves, he's approached by one of his men, asking if he wants to enact the plan, with him approving to do so. Whilst Kiri was consoling Reina after what transpired, a bunch of Nishiki family men stormed the bar. Kiryu fighting them off with one being launched out the back door, with more of them being in the building's back alley. Amongst them, the Nishikiyama family captain, Koji Shindo, saying the attack was boss's orders. Personal. Kill him! So overall, we've had another introduction with Koji, and we also now know Mizuki's dead. And essentially now it's been fully confirmed, Nishiki is a shithead and he's going to be the main villain. Nishiki is just... The worst. Oh, yeah, I can't think of any other thing to describe him as. He's so absurdly weird. <laughs> it's amazing how much Yakuza Zero did to make Nishiki a better character. Because <laughs> it's like, with the context of Zeros, this shit is kind of heartbreaking, but with just the context of Yakuza 1, it's just like, man, fuck Nishiki, all my homies hate Nishiki. He's just like a comic book villain. Yeah. Yes, he is. <laughs> okay, but other than how stupidly evil Nishiki is, uh, did you have anything else to talk about with Chapter 7? No, is it that, I feel like that just kind of takes the cake. <laughs> yeah, my brain is fried from all this chaos. It's just like we're solely focused on Nishiki. Like Nishiki is just like a car crash so that you can't look away from. <laughs> He's such a mess. <laughs> <laughs> chapter 8, The Scheme. I wonder if there's going to be a scheme in this chapter. Oh, it's hard to tell. I don't know. After what went down at Serena, Kiri decides he should lay low and heads back to Purgatory. But when he gets there, the place is ablaze with firefighters working to put out the fire due to an explosion having gone off earlier. Kiryu goes to the hideout where Date and the florist tell him that just one hour ago, after Haruka confessed she was considering running away in order to try and stop any further harm coming to Kiryu, a bunch of gangs bombed their way in, with one having hit Date over the head with a metal pipe. The gangs having kidnapped Haruka. Everyone just needs to chill, Jesus Christ. The florist says that the gangs that attacked do dirty work for the Yakuza, and consist of three colour-based smaller groups. 
Blue Z, White Edge, and Bloody Eye. Unfortunately, due to Purgatory's systems going down, he can't find out which specific gang took Haruka. Kiryu, seeing no other options, decides to hunt down the gangs to find out which one it was, with Date going to the station to see if he can find a trail to Haruka. Kiryu first overhears from people outside of Purgatory that some guys in blue headed to Children's Park, which turns out to be members of Blue Z. After being beaten up, they then tell Kiryu to get more info from White Edge. After scouting around, Kiryu finds them in a square lot in the Champion District, with him then beating down the group's leader along with some of the members. Hey! Kill this! Dumb motherfucker! <laughs> The leader then telling Kiryu that Haruka was captured by Bloody Eye, who are in Club Debola. With all these like color coded villains, it's like what if the Power Rangers just split up and form their own factions? At that point, Kiryu also gets a call from Date saying Division 1 are taking on a case claiming Haruka is a kidnap victim and that a faction outside of the Tojo must be responsible for it, with Kiryu needing to get Haruka before they do. Bum, bum, bum. Thank you. After heading to Debola, Kiryu demands they either hand over Haruka or get massacred. Oh my god. Funny. <laughs> if you think you can take all of us on, then bring that shit, motherfucker. <laughs> After Kiryu kicks their shit in, he continues to beat down one of their leaders until they tell him where Haruka is, with him saying they were hired to get her by Lao Kalong, the leader of the Snake Flower Triad, a Chinese triad based in Yokohama's Chinatown. So yeah, we're getting the Chinese Mafia in now. <laughs> Yay! Cool. Kiryu, having had a previous run-in with Lao when the Snake Flower tortured him after he was caught selling fake passports on their turf. Kiryu being saved at the last minute by Kazama just before he got his eyes gouged out. Oh god. At the cost of Kazama getting shot in the leg, which is why he now walks with a limp. Kiryu then meets up with Date in order to head down to Yokohama to take on the Snake Flower. That's a cool name. All these cool names. We cut to Shimano, who is having a meeting with Lao, having a discussion on how they'll split the 10 billion after the Snake Flower captured Haruka, with Shimano saying the Snake Flower will get 30% of the money. And when Lao questions why Shimano is getting 70%, he rebutes it since he's actually only taking 50%. The remaining 2 billion will go to Tarada, the Omi chief of HQ, and the same guy who tipped off Nishiki to the stolen money in the first place. Revealing the whole plan of telling Nishiki about the money was part of Shimano's plan to take over the Tojo, saying he's not going to be outranked by someone 20 years younger than him. I want to say, outside of chapter 6, since it's a filler chapter, chapter 8 is probably the most nothing chapter. It's literally just Kiryu hunts down a bunch of gangs to figure out who kidnapped Haruka. Also, Mizuki's the first character that we actually know who died. Oh yeah, we f completely forgot to mention that <laughs> in the previous <laughs> oh, chapter. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, someone's dead. Whoa, crazy. Yeah, it's just like someone we actually kind of knew died. <laughs> Chapter 9, The Rescue. I wonder if there's going to be a rescue. Oh, we don't know. It's not like it wasn't built up over the previous chapter. <laughs> On the drive to Yokohama, Kiryu talks with Date about Haruka, about how she was solely driven by wanting to find her mother, and kept a distance from Kiryu by dissing herself from him with it reminding him of his actions 10 years ago. That him taking the form for Nishiki might not have been him trying to protect who he cares about, but instead him trying and failing to force a change of fate, when he should have tried to fight back against fate. And that if Haruka's going to fight her fate, Kiryu's going to put his life on the line for her. Aww. So cheesy with the whole fate stuff. Yeah, it's just it's the Japan story. They like their fate. Also, isn't this game from like the early 2000s? 2005, yeah. When they get to the Snake Flower HQ, Kiryu tells Date that whilst he's inside saving Haruka to look more into Division 1's case of Haruka getting kidnapped. Essentially, it's the logic of 
realistically, given Date's shown prowess, he'd probably just be slowing down Kiryu. When Kiryu enters, like, the Chinese restaurant that the Triad are based in, he asks one of the waiters to tell Lao he wants to meet him. The waiter claims to not know who that is, but another worker behind the desk is seen by Kiryu talking to someone over the phone, before brandishing a gun to shoot at Kiryu, at which point, Kiryu then uses the waiter as a human shield. What? <laughs> what? Okay. This this went in several different directions, none of which I predicted. This is like, and and then this happens. Yeah. Suddenly this happens, and then. <laughs> At this point, the restaurant goes run out, with the rest of the staff and other triad members coming out to stop Kiryu. However, he fights them off, eventually reaching Lao's office, where Haruka is tied up. Lao tells Kiryu about how he kidnapped Haruka as per request of Shimano. With him saying that no one, not even Shimano, knows the true value of Haruka, and that he already sold the pendant to Nishiki, claiming Shimano was too cheap, with him only being interested in holding Haruka, which then kicks off a fight between Lao and Kiryu. What value does this guy see in a little girl? Yeah, that's that's like the most kind of creepy, hard. I'm gonna lie. <laughs> bit concerning. <laughs> Come now, allow me to show you what the Triad is really capable of. After defeating Lao, Kiryu frees and then gets hugged by Haruka, at which point the police storm in, pseudo amongst them, who arrest Kiryu for kidnapping. What? Okay. Right, so basically, you know how they said that Haruka was kidnapped? Apparently the report was claiming Kiryu was the kidnapper. Oh. The only thing the police know how to do is slow everything down. At the police HQ, Date questions how the case was kidnapping, Sudo not caring what Date says because he won't release Kiryu regardless of if it was or not which is why he told Date to stop investigating. So, you could be innocent, but you know what, we'll just keep you anyway. Kiri was seen in his cell, quickly bolting up when Haruka visits, with her apologising, feeling responsible for what happened, and that she just wanted to keep him and everyone else safe. Kiryu comforting her by letting her know it's not her fault, with Date soon entering to break Kiryu out of his cell. <gasps> the rescue is the... It's the titular rescue. Date's a real one. Yeah, Date's a lad. On the drive, Date says he's fine breaking Kiryu out since he was going to get fired anyway, with him then telling Kiryu what he found out after looking at the case. He reveals that the pins worn by the men who kidnapped Haruka in Stardust belongs to an underground government organization of the cabinet office called the Ministry Intelligence Agency, or the MIA who take orders directly from the cabinet, with the man in charge being a member of the Diet with a history of law enforcement called Jingu. The government's involved now? Yep. <laughs> what is this? Despite this, Date hasn't found a connection between Jingu and either Haruka or the Ten Billion. Kiryu believing the connection to a politician could be what Lao meant by Haruka being more valuable than the 10 billion. Also, it turns out the body that was pulled out of the harbour wasn't Mizuki. It turns out it was a completely different person based on DNA and dental records, meaning Haruka's mother could still be alive, with Kiryu saying no matter how dangerous things get, he'll protect Haruka until they find Mizuki. So yeah, not only are the government involved, it turns out Mizuki's not dead. We love a good fake out death. That's crazy though. Later on during the drive back to Kamurocho, the car is shot at by members of the Snake Flower, wanting vengeance for Kiryu's raid. Date flooring it with him giving Kiryu his gun to shoot at the Triad members. <laughs> Chapter 10, Shape of Love. Wasn't that a movie that came out, like, a couple years ago? Oh, are you thinking of The Shape of Water? Yes, I am. Okay. 
<laughs> no, this isn't about fish people. So later during the drive back, Date gives Kiryu his phone, but on Kiryu's phone is a message from Shinji. Now Shinji overheard from a family meeting that Nishiki knows more than he should, suggesting one of Kiryu's allies has been feeding information to him. I think we all know more than we should. At this point. At which point Kiryu then decides to visit the florist. When they get there, he asks to see footage of Serena, namely to four days ago when Kiryu headed out to ask Utabori about the flower tattoo, where after he and Date left, Reina then picks up the phone and talks about Kiryu's plans, confirming she was the one leaking info to Nishiki, with the florist recognizing her as the masked woman asking where Haruka was. How do you recognize someone who was wearing a mask? Uh, you can still see, like, their eyes, probably. Oh. You could tell by their voice. Yeah, yeah, probably. After this, Kiryu, Date, and Haruka head over to Serena, but when they get there, the bar is being trashed with red stains on the floor. I wonder what those red stains are. Crazy. Mm, probably someone spilt wine again. Oh, <laughs> juice. Jam. They find a letter from Raina confessing to selling out Kiryu, claiming she did it due to having romantic feelings towards Nishiki, hoping that by doing so, he would reciprocate them. But why Nishiki? Of all people. <laughs> why? <laughs> No, no, no. He's got if... a point, he's got a point. <laughs> oh it's... my god, this is something that was approved by so much in Zero. <laughs> this is just the like... Most insane motives I've ever heard. Yeah. <laughs> also, just like, that's how you think you, you're gonna get him to like you? It's like, man, political espionage is so hot. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, how can I get this guy to like me? Let's sell out his brother to him. <laughs> So yeah, she did that because she was hoping that if she did it, Nishiki'd like her. But after seeing Kiryu, Haruka, and Date, she remembered what really mattered and decided to take responsibility to make up for what she's done. After reading the letter, Kiryu then gets a call from Shinji, saying Reina called Nishiki over in an attempt to shoot him, and that he went on the run with her, but he's not sure where he is. Kiryu's saying he'll come over to get them. So Reina's tried to kill Nishiki. Yeah, but it, basically Reina, after like spending time with Kiri, Haruka, and Date, realized how badly she fucked up. So in an attempt to try and make up for it, she tried to assassinate Nishiki. That is a stretch to be sure. But... Yeah, that's quite... Like, I don't know what happened from point A to point B to get to assassination, but okay. Also, for a series that's about the Mafia, everyone is really bad at murder well i mean the series is literally called yakuza and we got kicked out of the yakuza in the first chapter in order to figure out where shinji is keri follows like a blood trail around kamarojo that eventually leads to an abandoned building on park boulevard wait are you talking like an actual blood trail yeah like literally around the city there's just like bits of red blood and that eventually leads you to where shinji is <laughs> Like it's fucking Scooby-Doo or something. That's not how that works. That's not <laughs> how any of that works. Well, how else were they supposed to clone the player of where to go? I don't know, it's not <laughs> blood spread across an entire city. How many liters would that need? <laughs> I don't know, maybe Shinji just has more blood than the average person. He's just built different. <laughs> okay, so when Kiryu enters the abandoned building, he overhears a Nishiki family man on the phone, talking about how he found the place Shinji's in, with him saying the family needs to get it sorted before Sergeant Arase shows up and the guns go blazing. Kiryu fights his way through the building, eventually crossing rooftops and dodging gunfire before coming across an injured Shinji, bleeding out from a bullet wound. No, Shinji. No. Soon after, Kazuto Arase, the sergeant of the Nishiki family, arrives, and with him, Reina's limp body riddled with bullets. The sight of which causes Kiryu to roar into the sky before taking down Arase and the remaining Nishiki family men. <laughs> Kiryu closes Reina's eyes before heading back to Shinji. He tells Kiri that Kazama is with a woman named Akemi, a girl Shinji fell for, with him giving Kiri Yumi's ring before he too passes away. Shinji? 
Shinji! I'd say now we have our first two major character deaths. And they're not fake outs this time. Yeah, no, they they are legitimately dead. I I'm gonna miss I'm gonna miss Shinji. He was a real one. A real bud to the end. But with Reina, I'm I'm not sad. I'm not happy. I'm just confused. <laughs> it's it's just like it's her motives changed to such an extreme of it's like oh look at this little girl in Kiryu. I'm going to go murder the man I love. <laughs> Yeah, it's just like, I, I love Nishiki, I'm going to sell out, I'm going to sell out one of my close friends in order to get to him. Actually, now that I've seen my close friend remind me of how much of a good friend he was alongside his other friends, I'm going to betray Nishiki by shooting him. After being in love with him for no reason. <sighs> just trust but me. Back to the Nishiki. <laughs> just trust me when I say zero makes it make sense because in zero it's established he's been like a regular at her bar for like i think by the time of yakuza won like 27 years but no not 27 17 years even that information would be more helpful now i feel mm. like <laughs> if they showed it now in the series but yeah know, probably not fun. and I, it's one of those things where it's like yeah zero fixes it but at the same time it's probably one of those things that shouldn't need a prequel to fix it Chapter 11, Honor and Humanity. The two moods. The two genders. <laughs> Shinji and Reina's bodies have been brought to purgatory for a proper burial, since there was no one else to leave them with. Kiryu tells the group about needing to look for Akemi, with the florist believing he's specifically referring to an Akemi who works as the number one girl at a soap land called Shangri-La, given Shinji's love for adult entertainment. Oh. <laughs> For anyone who doesn't know what a soap land is, what he's basically saying is Akemi is a prostitute. Ah. See, Shinji sounds quite cultured, I have to say. Mm. <laughs> Haruka then asks Kiryu what a soap land is, leading to an awkward scene where he tries to come up with a PG way of describing a prostitution house. <laughs> <laughs> or you can just be like, you know what? Don't worry about it. Only to reveal she was just messing with him, already knowing what it is given the amount of time she spent in Camarocho. Whoa. Good to know. Well, Camarocho is like a red light district, which if you don't know, red light district means sex. The florist tells Kiryu that in order to get into Shangri-La, he'll need a membership card, which then leads to a runaround where Kiryu asks a girl who used to work there called Shinmei for one. Her now working as a hostess for Club Shine, with her saying she'll do it if he can get her some fake documents so that she doesn't get deported due to being an illegal immigrant from China. Directing him to a mysterious forger in another hostess club called Club Jewel, specifically needing to ask a girl named Ayaka for it. He goes there and asks Ayaka, however, she seems to be oblivious to a forger, with Kiryu then leaving, being asked by the barmaid why he was leaving on the way out. Why were you leaving when you were leaving? That's no, crazy. basically it's like, why are you leaving so fast? Because usually oh, when you, because oh, okay. you usually pay like really big amount of money to sit with them for like half an hour, forty-five minutes, and Kiri's just leaving after five minutes because like she doesn't know who the forger is. Well, get there late, leave early. I can respect that. On his way out of Jewel, he sees some shady guys entering the club. Kiri deciding to follow them back in, walking in on them threatening Ayaka over where the forger is, with both her and the barmaid escaping after hitting them over the head with glass bottles while my backs were turned. The true warrior's way. Kiri then follows the two, seeing them get cornered by more goons, who turned out to be the remnants of the snake flower, who are attacking them due to them now being in the red thanks to the forger causing them to lose sales on fake passports. That's a crime. Yeah. I could. Oh my god. I'm so shocked by criminal activity in Yakuza. Shut the fuck up! You know, because of you, we've had to go through a lot of shit. Die, motherfucker! Kiryu fends them off, Aika then agreeing to let Kiryu get the documents and revealing that the barmaid was the forger the whole time. Oh my 
girl. This goes deeper and deeper. <laughs> when Kiryu gets the documents, the forger then tells Kiryu that Kazama actually came to her for fake documents five years ago, asking her to fake an entire identity with stuff like birth certificates, driver's licenses, passports, diplomas, and medical records. That's rookie numbers. Well, there was more, but I couldn't, I couldn't be asked to list more. <laughs> Kiryu then gives Shinmei the fake documents, only to find out she already sold the Shangri-La membership to an old friend, who Kiryu then has to buy it off. Just casually gives it to an old friend. Now that Kiryu finally has the card, he and Haruka head off to Shangri-La to meet with Akemi, due to Date having to deal with summons from the higher-ups. When they enter, one of the workers tries to turn them away, as having a nine-year-old in a soap land is not a good thing. Though, Kiryu manages to convince him otherwise after he destroys half a stone statue with one punch. Oh, okay, well... Yeah, I have no words for that. He's just asserting his dominance, you know? They head up the building to meet with Akemi, first delivering the news that Shinji is dead, with her mentioning that he said if anything happened to him, Kiryu would come to see her, with her also recounting how he said once everything was over, they were going to get married. That's quite a thing to drop. Yeah. Yeah. She then tells Kiryu that Kazama was here, but was moved with the help of another associate the Omi Alliance's Tarada, with them going to Shibora, specifically a boat docked on the wharf. On top of this, she also tells Kiryu that in addition to the 10 billion, Nishiki is also looking for Sarah's will, as it names who he appointed as the Tojo's fourth chairman. Another MacGuffin. We love to see it. Yeah, another MacGuffin just in time for the, like, the third to last chapter. Oh, thank God we got one. Mm. That was close. Suddenly, the building shakes. This being thanks to Majima returning from his hospital visit by crashing a truck into the side of the building, releasing the Majima family inside. As you do. Kiryu goes to escape with Haruka and Akemi, a fighting off the Majima family on the way out, before eventually running into the big man himself who's holding one of the employees with a knife to their throat, with him suggesting she becomes his girlfriend. However, she turns him down, saying she's already in a relationship. Majima, respecting her honesty, lets her go, telling her to get out quickly, before challenging Kiri to a rematch whilst the building collapses around them. <laughs> <laughs> we were rudely interrupted at the climax of our battle the other day. Why don't we pick up where we left off to see who's really on top, Kazuma-chan? Upon being defeated, he once again shows respect for Kiryu's strength before passing out. Back in Purgatory, Shinji's ashes are given to Akemi, whilst Kiryu tells Date about how they know where Kazama is now, Date saying he got drilled at the station, implying that the MIA and Jingu are putting on more pressure to capture Kiryu. However, the police department can't fire Date since he's the only connection they have to Kiryu. Well, must that be the only reason why I have a job? Now all that's left is for Kiryu is to see Kazama once again. I think literally the highlight was Majima comes back after being absent since I want to say like chapter five. Yeah, no, he hasn't. He hasn't been around since he got hit in the face. That's the weird thing, Majima's like this super popular fan character now, in Yakuza 1 he only shows up three times, once in chapter 1, then again in chapter 5, and then he disappears until chapter 11. So is he popular because of how he is in the um, later games? Yeah, kind of, with it also being massively boosted like the two times he was made playable in like the zombie spin-off and the prequel Zero. Chapter 12, Reunited. I wonder if it's going to be so reuniting. <laughs> I'm going to do that every time, by the way. Kiryu and Haruka arrive at the wharf, spotting Tarada on the boat, who, as it turns out, was the person who untied Haruka back at the batting cages. Uh, he greets them and explains he's helping for the same reason Kiryu is. He owes Kazama a debt that can't be paid back with money, with him then taking the two to Kazama. 
Kazama apologizes for all the trouble he's put Kiri through and says that Tarada used to be a hitman just like him, and that he specifically brought in Tarada to probe the Tojo, namely Nishiki. Kazama finally fills Kiryu in on what happened during the 10 years he was in prison. Oh, now we're gonna talk about it, okay. Starting by stating that Yumi and Mizuki are the same person. Mizuki being an alternate identity created for her five years ago, in turn meaning Yumi is Haruka's mother. What? Wait, I'm... What? <laughs> I'm so confused. Right, so you know how Reina mentioned that Mizuki looked exactly like Yumi and claimed to be a twin sister despite Yumi never mentioning her before? And also how you had the forger from earlier saying that Kazama asked her to create a completely new identity five years ago, which is the exact same time Mizuki showed up. So then who's Haruka's father? Oh, we'll get to that. Kiri then asks, who's Haruka's dad? Kazama revealing it to be Kyohei Jingu, the man in charge of the MIA. Kazama providing a picture of the two together whilst Haruka was a baby. This is all so insane. He explains that the day after the murder of Dojima, despite having lost her memory, she instinctively ran back to Sunflower Orphanage, Kazama then taking her in to try and help her regain her memories. When he showed her some pictures of her family and friends, she started getting flashbacks to the murder upon seeing a picture of Nishiki, which is how Kazama figured out he was the one who actually killed Dojima. Which is also why Kazama didn't tell Nishiki about Yumi. Wow, we're just dropping everything in this chapter. Yeah, basically. We are the climax, so... Yeah, this is the yeah. second to last chapter of the game. He then tells Kiryu that she met Jingu due to him having close ties to Sarah. Sarah basically being his behind-the-scenes backup for his political climb. Which is essentially, in turn, how Jingu met Yumi. Because, like, Yumi's close with Kazama, Kazama's close with Sarah, Sarah's close with Jingu, and hence Jingu would meet Yumi. A friend of a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend. Basically. Whilst Jingu and Yumi's relationship was strong at first, he was given a proposition to marry the Prime Minister's daughter, with Yumi backing down since the two weren't married and wanting the best for Jingu. Fair enough. However, this had caused Jingu to gain immense amounts of power without truly earning it, warping him into someone willing to do anything to make sure he didn't lose said power, with Kazama being left to look after both Yumi and Haruka. So he's just Nishiki 2.0, essentially. Kind of. One night, Sarah got a call from Jingu. He had just murdered a journalist who was using his relationship with Yumi as blackmail, and specifically needed Sarah to help him hide the body. Oh god, okay. Despite Sarah having already burned all the letters and pictures, it wasn't enough for Jingu, with him then requesting Sarah send a hitman to kill Yumi and Haruka in order to basically assure this doesn't happen again. Wow. The hitman ended up being incapacitated by Kazama, with Sarah having been in Yumi's room the whole time, saying he had to do it as a promise to Jingu. Kazama retorting, no promise is worth sacrificing a woman and her child. The whole incident also caused Yumi to regain her memory, thanks to it reminding her of Dojima's shooting. I'm just trying to, like, comprehend everything that's happening. Kazama then talks Sarah down, with them both arranging a way to hide Yumi and Haruka from Jingu, which is how they came up with Mizuki and Ares. There's then one final reveal that the 10 billion stolen from the Tojo was never the Tojo's money, instead belonging to Jingu. What? <laughs> that's crazy. Just then, the boat starts shaking, Tarada stating they're under attack from the Shimano family and need to escape. Whilst Haruka, Kazama, and Tarada get out, Kiryu fights off the Shimano men on the upper deck of the ship, with him having to run and jump off the boat thanks to the men on the harbour lobbing grenades. Of course we get interrupted after that bombshell. By literal bombshells. By literal bombshells. Yeah, literally. <laughs> 
After Kiryu resurfaces, the group is then cornered by Shimano, gloating about how he knew Torada was a traitor from the start and that Kazama's endgame is shit. However, Kazama then pulls one over Shimano, revealing a series of trailers filled with Kazama family men led by Kashiwagi, describing the whole thing as bringing in a hefty present for Christmas. Why does it sound like Die Hard to me? <laughs> it's probably just the Christmas, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It just sounds like a line from that movie. A full brawl breaks out between the Shimano and Kazama family. Looks like the Fuma family grew a set of balls. All right then, let the massacre begin. with Kiryu being the only one still standing. However, as soon as Kiryu turns his back to talk with Kazama, Shimano lobs a grenade before getting gunned down by Tarada, with Kazama taking the hit from the grenade to protect Haruka. Um. Kazama tells Kiryu the money was stolen as a joint effort between Yumi, him, and Sarah, explaining Jingu was using the Tojo to launder money, with them then taking it in order to out Jingu. Yumi's been doing a lot of stuff. He tells Kiryu to go to Ares in order to save Yumi, with him also giving Sarah's will. A flashback scene showing that it was written after Kazama confirmed the money was stolen, with Sarah knowing that Nishiki and Shimano would start scheming to become the fourth chairman, and that as the third chairman, he can't go into hiding regardless of the danger, entrusting Kazama with his will. I see. Before dying, Kazama gives one last confession. He tells Kiryu that he was the one who killed his biological parents, and that Sunflower Orphanage was his way of taking care of the kids of the people he had to kill. As he passes, Kiryu tells him it's okay, since as far as he was concerned, Kazama was his real dad. Okay, you can't see me, my jaw is like on the floor right this now. Is, no, like I... I... As a joke, in our first recording, I said, oh yeah, Kazama <laughs> like, adopts the kids of the parents he's murdered. Mm. Why am I always right? <laughs> I don't know. You don't understand how much panic was going through my brain the moment you said that. It's just like, fuck, how does he know? How does he know? <laughs> oh my god. At this point, I'm surprised you didn't pick up on Yumi and Mizuki being the same person. That one was bizarre. Yeah, to be honest, that that one was a little bit too out of left field for me to like piece together. You think it's not gonna get crazy, and then it just doubles down and gets crazier with every <laughs> passing sentence. Can you believe this all started with just Carrie Ker taking the fall for a murder? Yeah. Yeah, no, and then he he goes in prison for ten years, and then crazy shit just starts <laughs> happening. <laughs> ever since he goes to prison. Yeah, it's just mental. Finale, the end of battle. I wonder if a battle will end. I was waiting for it. Yeah. <laughs> After calling Date and stopping by Stardust, Kiryu and Haruka head out for the Millennium Tower. But as soon as they step out, they're surrounded by a large number of gang members who have all been promised compensation from Nishiki in exchange for killing Kiryu. However, Kiryu promises he'll protect Haruka no matter what, Kiryu shouting at them that he's not holding back anymore, and if they're ready to die, step up. Wow, that's cool. This guy's a fucking fighting machine. Shit! We ain't through yet! Meanwhile, back at the police station, Date digs up evidence of Jingu's history with Sarah, only to get caught by Sudo. After taking the gangs out, Kiryu and Haruka reach the tower, however the building is filled with MIA agents who Kiryu also fights off. Stop sneaking around and show your face! Oh! <laughs> 
Cutting back to Date, he and Sudo are rushing up a flight of stairs, with Sudo saying that after what happened in Yokohama, something didn't sit right with him, leading him to investigate Jingyu on his own, soon discovering the connection to Sarah and the 10 billion, with him being curious about what exactly Jingu was planning to do with the money, believing another institution aside from the MIA and Tojo could be involved, claiming his detective instinct came from Date, with them planning to take a helicopter ride to the Millennium Tower. It's just everyone's involved, it's like, yeah. a billion people. The homeless <laughs> people are involved, the children are involved, that pigeon is involved. <laughs> That pigeon is a member of the Yakuza. <laughs> <laughs> that great, pigeon huh? is a member of the Korean Mafia. Jingu's father is the pigeon. <laughs> <laughs> Kiryu and Haruka arrive in Ares, where they finally meet Yumi, who drops a knife she had for protection upon seeing them. The three embracing each other before hearing a noise outside. It turns out to be Jingu along with more MIA agents. Jingu introduces himself to Kiryu. He's here for both the 10 billion and tie up the loose ends with him attempting to shoot Haruka, only for Kiryu to get in the way of the bullet. The dude shot, tried to shoot his own daughter. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Christ. Kiryu asks how a man can just murder his own child, with Jingu simply writing her off as baggage. What the fuck? <laughs> What? <laughs> this is evil. This is not. This is not okay. This is not okay. <laughs> okay. This isn't okay. Yumi interrupts, saying, "There's no point trying to reason with Jingu." Pointing out how Jingu says everything he does is for the sake of the country, when really it's just to satisfy his own lust for power. Before Jingu and his men can shoot up Kiryu and company, Tarada enters the scene with some Omi men to level the playing field, only for the men to turn on and knock out Tarada, revealing Jingu has switched alliances from the Tojo to the Omi, revealing the plans go as far back as a year ago between Jingu and the Omi chairman. Jingu being fully aware that Sarah was going to betray him after learning that Yumi was still alive. Jingu's plan was to get control of the Omi, as having control of both politics and organized crime would make him the effective ruler of Japan, with the 10 billion being the money he was planning to hand over to the Omi. Politics and organized crime aren't necessarily opposites. <laughs> With him revealing he was also the one who told Nishiki about the 10 billion, using manipulation to get him to kill Sarah, in turn kicking off the Tojo civil war in order to collapse them. With him even mentioning Kiri's involvement has actually made destroying them easier by leading to the deaths of even more high-ranking members. This is so specific, because if he's found out, or if anyone dies before they're supposed to, his plan is worthless. Yeah, I don't, yeah. Know. I don't know. Yumi then reveals that the briefcase she brought with her is actually a bomb that she plans to use to blow up the 10 billion. What? What? <laughs> Why? <laughs> well, what? Yeah, Yumi brought a bomb to blow up all the money just so no one can get it. <laughs> Where did she get a bomb? I don't know, <laughs> she probably got it from around. Kazama or any of the other criminals she's why, friends why with. Why does she have it? Oh my god. <laughs> what is happening right now? What is happening? <laughs> what is that? What? I don't get it. Yumi then basically uses the bomb as a way to prevent Jingu from shooting her and Haruka as they leave the scene. Kiryu then tells Jingu that Sarah knew of his plan the whole time, with him presenting the will. A flashback then reveals Sarah never actually named who should be the fourth chairman, believing himself to have been unfit to run the Tojo in the first place, leaving it to Kazama to choose who should be the next leader of the Tojo. Kiryu states Jingu planted the idea of a will in Nishiki's head, not knowing a will actually existed, revealing that Kiryu was named the fourth chairman. And because Sarah and Kazama gave their lives to protect it and do what they felt was right, Kiryu's not going to stop until Jingu is taken down. Kiryu then proceeds to take down the backstabbing Omi, the remaining MIA officers, as well as Jingu himself. So, what happened to Nishiki? 
Oh, we're getting there, don't worry. Once back inside, Nishki enters the room. <laughs> oh, well, how about immediately after? Anyway, once back inside, Nishki enters the room. Here for the final showdown and refusing to give up until he's chairman. Claiming he knew Jingu was lying to him the whole time, reminding Kiryu that since Dojima's murder, he couldn't trust anyone. Not believing anything Jingu said since the first meeting. Saying he did it because he didn't want to lose to Kiryu. I feel like Nishiki has like some kind of inferiority complex. Oh, he most <laughs> certainly yeah. has an inferiority complex. <laughs> Like, he's still obsessing over beating Kiryu, despite the fact that Kiryu has literally gone through hell and has lost most of his standing within the Yakuza. He says that he always loved Yumi, but she never gave him so much as a second glance due to her loving Kiryu. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, okay, it's always love, isn't it? Yeah. And since the incident, he felt part of his life was missing, him then deciding he'd sacrifice everything to change fate, killing anyone he needs to in order to gain absolute power of the Tojo using the 10 billion, as well as take Yumi, finally gaining control of his own life and fate. Yumi tells Nishiki that changing his fate the way he has won't change anything or make him happy. Happy. And at this point, he's just running away from the inevitable, saying if he truly wants to change fate, he has to accept the suffering and face it head on, like Kiryu and Haruka have. This only angering Nishiki, questioning why she can't acknowledge what he's achieved. Kiryu tells Nishiki he gets his pain after his time in prison, but at this point, it's too late to undo what's happened. And at this point, all that's left is for him and Nishiki to sell things, leading into the final fight. So Nishiki did all this shit because he was in love with Yumi. Yeah, basically, it's what no pussy does to a motherfucker. Okay, I did not expect that. <laughs> well, I mean, it's true, based on what I've described. To settle this shit for good. Once the fight is over, Kiryu pulls out the pendant which Yumi then unlocks, revealing a picture of Kiryu, with her saying that once she got her memory back, she couldn't stop thinking of Kiryu, even having faint memories of him when she had amnesia, saying she got with Jingu because she couldn't wait for Kiryu, with her giving Haruka the pendant since she was her one true treasure. That's nice. Well, I don't understand why, like, love and insanity are synonymous in this series at some point. <laughs> I mean, it kind of is in real life. Yeah. That's, that's, a, that's a nice lesson. Love and insanity are the same. She then puts the pendant into a scanner, which reveals the secret room that the money was being held within, placing the bomb alongside it in order to get rid of it once and for all. Or, you know, she could just take the 10 billion. <laughs> Yes. Unless mm. they're gonna do like, oh, the money is the true villain. Well, basically. Yeah. Suddenly, Kiryu gets shot in the leg, the shooter being Jingu, who has returned to finish the job. Of course, just suddenly. Getting ready to fire again, with Haruka running in to protect Kiryu. However, Yumi ended up running in front of her, taking a bullet to the gut and immediately collapsing. Oh my god. Jingu gets ready to kill Kiryu, but Nishiki gets up, grabs Yumi's knife from earlier, and runs towards Jingu, stabbing him against the pile of cash. Stating there's no way he's going to let Jingu get away. He then grabs Jingu's gun, saying it's his responsibility to end everything, pointing it at the bomb, planning to blow both him and Jingu up with the money. And despite Kiryu's pleas to stop, 
Nishki pulls the trigger. Okay, no, my Nishki is less bad, but only slightly. At least Nishki figured out how much of a fuck up he was. Eventually. Eventually. You gotta, you gotta give him props for that, at the very least. Yeah. Yeah. The explosion goes off, with it immediately attracting the attention of the city goers on the ground level, with them then going in a frenzy once the money starts raining down. Back in the remains of Ares, Yumi apologizes for not getting to spend any time as Haruka's mother with Kiryu finally confessing the feelings he had for Yumi, and it being revealed that the ring was the only thing Kiryu gave Yumi as a present, hence why it was so important to him. Yumi says she doesn't regret what she did, as all she wanted was to see Kiryu again, and before dying, tells Haruka to never run away from her problems. The police finally get to the building, ready to arrest Kiryu, at which point, Sudo and Date enter. Date tells Kiryu he's done nothing wrong, but if he gets arrested now, he'll go to prison for life. Kiryu says he's fine with it, as by this point, everyone who he loved and considered family are dead. Date telling him to knock it off, telling him he does have something left to fight for. That being Haruka, since if Kiryu goes back to prison, she'll be all by herself again. We then cut forward in time, Kiryu once again running from the Tojo and being driven away by Date. It turns out, Kiryu quit the Tojo the same day he was named the fourth chairman, <laughs> with him leaving Tarada as the Tojo's fifth chairman, believing him as capable of rebuilding the clan. Good for, good for Tarada. Good for Tarada. Back in Kamurocho, Kiryu gives his farewells to Date, saying he's leaving, but might return one day, with Date saying he's planning to try and get more involved in Saya's life by living with her again. After a promise that Kiryu's criminal life is behind him, he heads off to meet with Haruka to start their new lives as a family. And yeah, that's, uh... That's Yakuza 1. It's often considered to be the weakest entry in the series, I think narrative-wise, at the very least. All I'll say is spread out the reveals, because my god, my brain is firing. <laughs> <laughs> Put it in earlier chapters, at least, that's all I'll say. But, mm. yeah. I, I don't think I'm ever going to be able to take at least the first game seriously. Yeah. Because, all, like... <laughs> All of my predictions I got correct. I wasn't even theorizing them. I literally just said them. I was talking out of my ass the entire time. <laughs> what what was right? It came true. Yeah, literally there were multiple times where you just said something and I just went panic mode because it was just like, shit, did he read the wiki summary? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's an option. We can just like, I'll just read the summary and then be like, oh, wouldn't it be crazy if this happened? That'd be crazy. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, um, okay, so I guess we should ask two overall questions, so what do you think of, like, the story as a whole? If I t I wouldn't enjoy this if I took it seriously, but considering that I didn't take this seriously, I really enjoyed it. Mm. <laughs> uh, Sorry of my life. <laughs> it's, like... It, it was very fun, like, having my Joe predictions come true, and then also there's, like, there's a decent amount of comic relief uh, provided by, like, Majima and the ridiculousness of Nishiki. Mm. <laughs> Nishiki, I can't I, take I know, that he, I know that he gets his, like, build-up in, in Zero, but still. Yeah, it's uh, one sorry. of those things where you can argue all you want. No, don't worry, don't worry, he's fixing the prequel, he's fixing the prequel. He shouldn't have needed a prequel to make him work. <laughs> Yeah, it should yeah. just work from the start. Unless they just like, or at least make him work by the end of the first one. Yeah. If anything, but okay. <laughs> Nishiki, I just can't take seriously as a bad guy at all. Uh, I guess. Like, what did you think of like Kiryu, since he's like our main protag? I I like Kiryu, but he seems to have a habit of getting involved in other people's shit. Yes. And then yeah. that shit somehow connecting back to him. <laughs> 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 I think as the games go on, unironically, as the games go on, it progressively becomes Kiri who just wants to live by himself, and like everyone else just won't leave him alone. <laughs> it's just like, I just want to live my life taking care of this child, and these criminals will not let me l live alone. <laughs> uh, 
Ah, yeah, so then second question. Would this story have interested you enough to consider playing Yakuza 2? Hmm, yeah. I think so. I would definitely like to see visually all this crazy shit that's been happening. Mm. Also, like, I, I'm curious about how they've managed to drag this out for eight, eight games. Well, seven games for specifically Kiryu Story, but you do have Yakuza 7, which has a new pro tag. Ah, uh, yeah, Ichiban. So I guess we'll probably just end it there. Do you have any last things? Like... 20 likes and we'll do a sequel. Yeah, 20 likes and we'll do Yakuza 2. 